54, 54, I think we're good.
welcome all of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, especially, uh, we welcome you. Mike, glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, for any any other visitors that uh, are here this morning, uh, we're blessed by having you here, and we invite you uh, back again in the near future. One other thing, uh, Kevin and I, uh, when you asked me about announcements, I'll mention this. Um, Herbert and I had talked about over at the Carson Vision. If you come by here tonight, it's dark. It's dark. And um, Herbert and I got some timers. So if you come by here and you start seeing lights on in the Carson mm -hmm. in the movie, and it's in that room and it's moving, we got some, some uh, lights and we're going on timers and it's just some water. So, uh, There's an echo. Every time I come by here, I'm looking for the hill. I see our church bus sitting there and I go So anyway, just want to mention that. Um, we're going to move to our prayer time now. Uh, there are lots and lots of folks that we know that need prayer for serious matters or daily life. Are you sure you Dealing with the pressures of daily life and how God to has to react to Oh, uh, it's not plugged up. Over, well, it's it's pulling off the Mevo. Uh, oh, that's right. That was you. This is the iPad. Uh, yeah. Mom, uh, it does say iPad. Oh. Uh, but, uh, friendly, friendly. Uh, for those things that are on your heart that are not it's listed like it's in the book, the they have not been mentioned. You lift it's those picking us up. Too, but let's start out with a little bit of and then we'll move into our conversation. I don't know if it's getting it off your phone or not. God, we come in your presence this morning. We come with joy because we know how much you love us. Father, we also come with heavy hearts because of all the things that, that we're dealing with. We see our culture around us, Father, turning away from you. And we know the implications of that brings for our community, for our state, and our nation. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would walk among us, each one of us here this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts so that we might live lives that would bring glory and honor to you, but also, Father, that would show joy among those that we know that are in our community, maybe that are throughout the state, others that we might know, Father. We pray that that strength, that joy that is in each one of our hearts, that it might be contagious and others might find you. I pray, Father, for the leaders of our country, there are so many issues. There's so much danger in the world today. But Lord, you have told us, be not afraid, for I'm always with you. And Father, we know that you are always with us. In each and every circumstance of our lives, in our individual lives, in the lives of this church, in the very life of our nation. Father, we just pray that you would fill our hearts with your joy always. That you would fill our hearts with courage that we would share your word among those that, that we live with every day. We pray that you would bless us according to your will and according to your holy purpose in each one of our lives. Father, we come before you and we remember the prayer that you, your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now receive our tithes and offerings.
appreciation for all the many blessings you give to each one of us. Please guide us and direct us to use these funds to further the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Amen.
scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts, verses 3, to chapter 9, verses 3 through 16. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Choir, for a great song. I contacted Eddie this week and asked him uh, if he would do the scripture of the offer told this morning. I had forgotten he was doing the so too. So <laughs> we're about to wear him out, but Eddie if you want to just finish up the whole <laughs> uh, but thank you for your service. Let us uh, open with word of prayer. Our God and our Savior Pray that you would be with each one of us this morning, that you would bless our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would be among us, that we would hear your word, that it would be buried deep into our hearts, so that we would come to know you, and trust you, and serve you for the rest of our life. In Christ's holy name we pray. probably recognize that our scripture is somewhat overlapping from last time. We're talking about Saul. Uh, Saul, a very dynamic man that uh, played a very, very key part in the history of the early church uh, that played a very, very key and strong role even in, up until today at this, this very moment. <clears throat> And we're continuing in our discussion in the life and the events of Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, how his life was miraculously redirected, and how his transformation led to the spread of the gospel throughout the world, down through time and even into our midst today. Last Sunday we talked about Saul, about his personality. We talked about how he was driven to act on all of those things that he truly believed and how he was focused and committed to accomplishing his personal goals. He went about his task with commitment and with lots of emotion, lots of zeal. In this case, as we discussed, it was a raging hatred that Saul had for the early Christians. He would put an end to the rebellion of these people against the Jewish leaders, against the very law of Moses, and against the chief priests. That is how Saul 
saw the actions and the deeds of these early Christians. And in the middle of the day, as he enthusiastically went about working his plan on the way to Damascus, the light of truth very suddenly was directed directly on him. It shot down from heaven. And we remember what it says in the scripture, what Eddie read. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Whenever we look at the story of Saul, there are so many things, revelations that are wrapped up in the scripture. When Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He doesn't say, why do you persecute my people? Jesus says, so why are you persecuting me? Jesus is showing ownership. Even of these young Christians, these, these young believers, Jesus is saying, you're not persecuting just people. You are persecuting me. These are my people. These are me. And then Saul, covering his face because of the bright light goes, he says, who are you, Lord? Kathy and I had a discussion this week about when, when Saul said, who are you, Lord? If you notice, Lord is capitalized. Saul had no idea that he was calling him. He knew, obviously, it was a voice from heaven. He saw no one. The men with him saw no one. He didn't know if it was an angel. He didn't know if it was maybe Moses. He didn't know if it was Methuselah. He didn't know if maybe it was even God himself speaking. It's interesting to know that Saul did not recognize the voice of the Lord. Jesus had always expressed to his disciples and his followers that believers recognize his voice. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus says very clearly, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. As the Apostle Stephen was being stoned in last week's scripture lesson, lesson scriptures describe how he, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up and saw the glory of God and saw the Son of Man standing at God's right hand. Stephen recognized Jesus. He knew Jesus. And he testified to Jesus as being God's very son. The Pharisee, Saul, knew about Jesus. He obviously didn't know Jesus. Nor did he recognize Jesus' voice. And in a split second, Saul realized that everything he had believed about Jesus of Nazareth, about his teachings and his followers, was totally 100% wrong. In Saul, in that moment, when he was under the spotlight, had one of those sudden moments where he went, Oh my God, what have I done? Have you ever had one of those moments in your life? Where you said to yourself, Oh my God, what have I done? I think we, we probably all have. Probably not to the degree of what Saul did, but, but we realized it was a self-realization. He was absolutely convinced that he was on the right track that he was going about doing God's will when Jesus himself shows up and he says, Saul, what are you doing? Jesus, in fact, was the Son of God, the Almighty God. He was the resurrected Son of God. He was, in fact, the promised Messiah that the Scriptures had foretold. And Saul totally missed it. What do you do when you're 
wrong? What do you do when you're wrong about important things? Let me tell you a story about, about our kids. It, it's nothing profound, but it's, it's just a story that kind of illustrates it. We have three kids, and obviously they're all wrong now, but whenever, whenever they were small and they were at home, and, and you have three active kids, we have two sons and a daughter, and very active. Uh, every day was a new adventure with them. Uh, they interacted a lot. They had lots of emotion, I promise you. Um, I went down into my workshop, and, and I don't even remember what it was now, but there was something, I don't remember if it was a, an instrument, but there was something, a tool, something that got broken somehow. I knew that I hadn't done it, and I, I went, well, one, one of the kids. And I called them together, and I said, guys, look, and, uh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal, but who, which one of you was? I didn't. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. And guess what? I got three no's. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, not a big deal. I, it, it's truly not a big deal, but whichever one of you did, just, just let me know. And it, it's not that I was focused, that obviously I can't even remember what it was, but I just remember going, God trust me enough that when something happens in your life or a mistake, an accident, or whatever, trust me enough just to come to me and say, Dad, yeah, I did it. I guess. And I said, Look, uh, you don't have to tell me now, but whichever one of you did it, just come to me. Come to me later on, let me know. Uh, and then we'll be fine. Nothing happened. We called them together again, and I said, Look, I'm one, I'm going to punish all three of you. <laughs> if whoever did it, if you don't tell me, come to me later. Phase two of the process. So one of them came to me later on and said, Dad, I'm, I'm sorry I did. I said, okay, okay, well, thank you for coming to me and telling me. Thank you. And I just, I want you to come to me even in difficult times when there's things that, that you, you know were difficult, just, just let me know. Okay, and, and so there was, there was some punishment, nothing, nothing major, but there was some punishment. Two days later, my next child came to me. And said, <laughs>
the world consequences, to our actions, to our deeds, to our beliefs, to our commitment to doing whatever it is we do, there are always consequences that works on the good side, it works on the bad side. So now we look at Saul. And Saul is dealing with the word called consequences also. In that split moment of, oh my God, what have I done? He knows that he was 100% wrong. And I know he said, how could I have been so wrong? I was raised up in the scriptures. I was taught the law. I was taught history. I was taught classic Greek. How could I have been so wrong? And he also said, people have died because of my actions. I have offended the very Son of God himself. I've sinned against God in himself. And then he said, I have to deal with the consequences of my sin. We do not know anything of what Saul's prayer life looked like before the road to Damascus. We don't know. Uh, there's just no mention in Scripture. Theologians tell us the most devoted Pharisees spent time in daily prayer as was expected of them, being that they were the leaders of the faith. One of the writers explained that it was likely that Saul, in meeting the expectations, of the position, likely spent time saying his prayers. Saying his prayers. A simple routine, not a time of confession, not a time of praise, nor a time of seeking God's purposes for him, nor a time of truth revealed. It was just a routine. But now, Saul's prayers now come from a very, very different place. They come from a place of guilt, guilt realized. His pleas were to God for forgiveness for all the wrongs, all the blasphemy, all the hatred, all the cruelty, and indeed, all of the lives that were lost because of his actions, his mistakes, his sins. And in this moment, all of the events of Saul's young life, all of his workings, all of his condemnations, and all of his efforts to end this belief of divinity, and this Jesus came avalanching down on him. He was crushing the weight of the realization of what he had actually done was unbearable for him. And when Saul finally stood up, he couldn't see the confusion, the glare of his companions looking at him. He couldn't see the terror in their eyes because they also realized what the revelation meant for them too. But Saul could not see that in their eyes because now he was blind. Jesus blinded him. And when he finally stood up and his speechless companions were there, at some point, we don't know if it was five minutes, maybe it was an hour down the road, his, command, and his companions had to have said, whose voice was that? And they asked him, they asked it of Saul, we don't know what Saul would have said because to answer the question would be to totally steal the beans. But at some point he probably said it was the voice of Jesus. To which his companions probably responded that, that he was crucified. He's gone. Paul was totally blind. And in his thoughts, it was likely for the rest of his life as his due punishment for 
for the terrible things that he had done. He had no idea. But all he knew was Jesus had given him instructions. Saul, you were, you were to go to Damascus. And when you get to Damascus, you will find out what you need to do. Paul would never be disobedient to the instructions that Jesus had given him. If Saul's instructions, his friends, led him by the hand into the city of Damascus. This dynamic, this strong, this man with all the charisma in the world, this strength, this belief, this personal power that he had around him. And it's well documented in Scripture was being led by the hand into Damascus for what only Jesus himself knew. And for three days, Saul dealt with this crushing realization of what he had done, all the things that he had done wrong. He wrestled with his failings with the very understanding how badly he had misunderstood who Jesus was. And he was wondering what consequences lay ahead for him. He couldn't eat. He couldn't drink. He knew that his punishment would be severe. He would likely be blind for the rest of his life, but that wasn't all. The tremendous guilt that he felt was there. All he could do to wrestle with the truth and to pray to God unceasingly with urgency for his mercy. His prayers were indeed pleased to God. Lord God, forgive me. And whenever we look at the scripture, it moves ahead to Damascus where a servant named Ananias is. And Ananias is a devout believer of Jesus. And Jesus came to Ananias. And he gave Ananias instructions and he said, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. It's significant here that Jesus himself says, Ananias, I need you to go. I need you to go with some urgency because this man, for he is praying, reveals something that is unusual for him. He is praying like he never prayed before. He is being transformed. But then, Lord, in a nice answer, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all of us and to carry us away to prison. But he's come to take away all of us and call upon your very name. And Ananias raises an issue that is upon all the hearts of the believers at the time. Jesus, you know who this man is. He has killed many of us among us. But then the Lord said to Ananias simply, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show you how much you must suffer for my name. Whenever, whenever I read that in scripture and I was thinking just in the moment, what is Jesus saying here? For I will show you how much he must suffer for my name. Is are these events to be punishment for Saul? No. What Jesus is telling Ananias here is this, 
this man that you have known in the past he is being hammered upon. He is being twisted. He is being molded. You don't have to be afraid of it. I am working on him. I am changing him. This is my very servant who will bring my word to the world. And Ananias, I know, was standing there going, this man, Then whenever we look at the scripture beyond what Eddie read this morning, we find out what happens. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias was able to overcome his fear because of God's ex explicit direction to go. But we also see here some other things that are somewhat kind of cloaked in the, in, in the details of the message. What we learn about Jesus and God. Jesus, God, is at work all around us all the time. God is orchestrating events in our lives and in this world constantly. And most of the time we don't see it. But one of the things here that is made very, very clear, God appears before Saul and says, what are you doing to my people? What are you doing to me? But then he sends, he sends a message to Ananias to say, this man who I have selected, I need you to go immediately to him and place your hands on him. Jesus, God, is always in the process of orchestrating events of our lives for his purposes. And it is urgent. The timing on this, my point being, Whenever God comes to us and he says, I need you to do something, that sounds a little bit outlandish maybe for God to come to us and say that he needs us to do something. Years ago, uh, and many of you remember, uh, we had two pastors in one of our interim periods. One of them was called, one of them's name was Dr. Mel Palmer. We had another gentleman named Bank Shepherd, and I'll tell you, Those were two men of God. If ever it was. Mel Palmer stood right here one Sunday. And he said, Many times in my life, as I've gone about traveling and, and going about ministry and going about visitations, something will pop in my head and say, you need to call John Smith. And he said, whenever that occurs, he said, I never question. And he said, the moment that I get the message, whatever I'm doing, if I'm driving, I pull over to the side of the road. If I'm, if I'm home shaving, I wipe my face off. But he said, immediately, I make the phone call, make contact with this person that suddenly comes to mind. Because he said it. God is always at work through us to do His will. And in His perfect timing, God is making preparations in our lives at this very moment for things we don't have a clue. We don't see it coming. Events that will happen in our lives for God's holy purpose. And it is with great urgency that whatever moment and whatever way it happens to us, a call from a friend, a text from somebody that we know, I need your help, will you pray for them? It is of the utmost importance the moment we realize it. According to a man that I admire greatly, 
but also according to Scripture. And we look at our Scripture today. Jesus said to Ananias, Go. The man is praying. He is seeking my help. He is seeking my truth. Go immediately. And when Ananias went, he said, Brother, Brother Saul, Ananias has accepted him perfectly. And he places his hands on Saul. And when he does, what happens? The little physical, it says, like scales, fell from his eyes. And once again, his sight was restored. Saul never expected to see it again. But with, with great excitement, he saw it again. But you know the, the most important part of it was? It wasn't the scales that fell off his eyes. It was the scales that fell off of his heart. That he understood God's truth and his purpose and what his son was all about. But as it says also, Ananias told Saul, I place my hands on you so that you might receive your sight, but also that you might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it tells us Saul spent several days with his disciples in Damascus. And after he had eaten and he had gotten water, he got his strength back. He had been struggling for three days without water, without food. But it says in the 20th verse, at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished. Absolutely astonished. The story is a story of transformation. Absolute transformation that only God could do in His own power and His own time. How have our lives been transformed? How, is, how has God worked in our lives? Likely, it was in things that we never expected. Things that we never saw coming. And just like Saul had the light sh shone on him like a flick of a switch. You know, maybe God's calling into our lives happened that quickly. Whenever Saul came to know the truth, whenever the truth was revealed to him, immediately, as soon as he got water and food in, in him, and he got his strength back, what did he do? He went about telling everybody the truth that he he just received. Now, whenever we look at our own lives, what has the truth done for our lives? How have we responded to the truth? In various ways. We all know the Holy Spirit for every believer <coughs> is sitting in this church at this moment. For every believer, you have been given a spiritual gift. You have natural talents anyway, but you have been given at least one spiritual gift. How do we as believers respond to God's calling in our life with that spiritual gift? And they're varied. And they might be for things that are dynamic and public, and they might be things that, that draws us under great pressure. They might simply be things where we have hospitality, where we show great love, where we do things making phone calls. Maybe it causes us to be compassionate and share our lives with other people. But God calls us to witness to His Son in a million different ways. And I just I encourage us today that we would be faithful to that calling. Maybe it doesn't take a bright beam of light shining down on us. I have a friend who was very much a believer. He came to know Christ, and he didn't specifically know.
know where it was going to carry. He was on a tractor one day. And as he's going about plowing, and he had stopped, and he had a, he had a Bible with him. And he opened the Bible up, and he started reading. And he felt an immediate, immediate, indescribable, inarguable calling from God to preach. How did he respond? He finished the field, he finished plowing, he went back to the car, he parked the tractor, he went into town, the local bookstore, and he bought Bibles in Spanish. He went back to the farm because all of the seasonal workers there spoke Spanish. He started preaching. And this all happened within a matter of probably, I'll say hours. I don't know specifically that it could come up. A guy named Pastor Paul Perkins, that you remember away. Urgency. Whenever the truth is revealed to us, we have to grasp. There is urgency to our call. I have a list of, of names of people that have stories to tell. There are many here in church that have stories to tell. I know several of you very well in the stories that you have shared. A lot of times in our lives, we feel like we have been disqualified because of something in our lives that maybe happened, maybe it's something that sin is a very real thing in all of our lives. Everyone here, every single one of us here has something buried in us. We all have to be calm. And God comes to us and he says, my child, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I have prepared you your whole life. All the things, the good, the bad, all those things that have brought turmoil, I have been preparing you for this moment. None of us or disqualified. It is in the moment of weighing things what we consider so many times disqualifications that God says that we look at the life of a guy named Saul. We look at the life of a lot of leaders that are in Scripture. We look at, at David. David who slew the giant who became King David. Look at his life. Look at Moses. Things that they did early on in their life that in their own hearts led them to say, the Lord can never use me. Never. Wrong. At this very moment, I don't care if you're 14 years old, I don't care if you're 94 years old. God calls us to serve Him every day. And again, it's not necessarily anything profound. I was talking with a lady this week who has a friend that has been going through some difficulties. She had been in counseling for many of life's overwhelming problems that she had just lost a handle on. She has been struggling in a lot of ways. There, there's just a lot of things in her life that she was dealing with. She was coming out of a counseling session. 
And this lady was telling me she had no idea that this friend of the lady who had been in counseling had no idea where she was, what she was doing. But she suddenly just had this thought, not an urge, but just a thought, you know, I'm sure she could stand some encouragement today. And she sends a text message to, to this lady. She is leaving the counselor's office. And the message was simply, I hope your day is going well and that you know how much people care for and love you. It's a simple message. But later on, she found out how profound an impact it had on this lady's life. As believers in sharing God's good news, His hope, His truth, it will totally transform not just our lives, but all of those around us. I was going to share a story today about an individual that uh, several of us know here. A young man that had been involved in our scout team. And I tried to contact him. I, I wouldn't dare tell his story. It's a, it's a difficult story. It is a story with some tragedy built into it. I would never stand up before you and tell his, his story without getting his permission first. I was never able to catch up with him. But I will tell you this. Young kid, innocent, typical kid, great kid. Everybody loved him. Being around him, he was fun-loving. He basically was Tom Sawyer. Great kid. And in one of those moments, judgment and misjudgment his life was forever changed maybe a little bit like Saul's different circumstances but it was changed he paid a good price people paid a good price he is a minister Very effective minister. He understands things that the rest of us can't understand. A guy named Saul was exactly the same one. He understood what it meant to be wrong, to fail, to be wrong even in the face of God. Saul had a depth of understanding. He became the Apostle Paul. And instead of being filled with the arrogance of Saul, he was filled with the humility of the Apostle Paul. Everywhere he went, he was one who understood the people who were at the end of the road, who was struggling, who was dealing with sin, who was dealing with no hope. The Apostle Paul understood. And he brought the hope of all eternity to him. I encourage each one of us here today to find those ways in which God is calling you to serve.
now I pray for each one of us that the Holy God and His Son Jesus would be with us this week. That He would guide our hearts. That He would place those opportunities in front of us to serve Him, to bring joy into other people's lives. I pray, Father, that You would give us courage and strength in all situations. Amen. Thank you.